this will be another reading of a narrative that I have written. If you're interested in Thai, chronic affair, chronos, agdon, chronia, cycles, linear data, sequential, alinear, ouroboric, interrupted, and so on, let's read. On cosmic clocks and the cycles of eons. Inducing the laws of transcendent worlds is difficult. This is the domain of metaphysics and theology. Most philosophers have tried to harness the understanding of these worlds to perfect ideas. Simplicity, divinity, goodness, justice, the divine fire, creative heavens, Tao and death. Depending on the school of thought one adheres to, the perspective on transcendence varies with the lens and angle of view, the philosophical cognitive apparatus and the cultural civilizational conditions, which can sometimes be extremely different. It is essential to remember this to avoid Western-centric preconceptions. Indeed, to derive any metaphysical laws, one must start with the proportions of simple components observed in the existing world, and then progress from the induction to generalities, and as we advance in formulations of more complex intervals, harmonies, tones, and philosophical architectures induce the particulars, as divinity does not contradict nature, yet it is an excellent generator coinciding with the world and then, by balancing them in duality, transfer them to the level of the third resolving superposition, their integration, fusion and liberation of the twin Hadusian currents. In the Eta at Delphi from Plutarch's Molaria, we find a fragment on mathematical theology, where number distinguishes the pattern from the primordial principle, and then, through the mutual friction of changes, generates a complete universe that again undergoes further transformations and changes. A fascinating example is the mammalian eye. The eye evolved from a light-sensitive spot in primordial organisms. The modern eye enables us to see the spectrum of visible light, distinguish colors, light intensity, interpret depth, forms, and so on. Without light, it could not have developed. Even Darwin opposed the theory that the eye was a pure anomaly of evolution. Teleologically, its evolutionary development was most likely conditioned by the need for electrochemical stimulation of the nervous system through opsin, which converted photons into stimulating impulses. Thus, the eye is a form of an interface between the world of radiation and the nervous system. Systemic co-evolution of systems, including biosphere and its entropy, protropy and negentropy, absolutely does not exclude all other functions and their adaptations, interpretations, nor does it negate smooth integration into metaphysical systems holistically. In an indivisible world, everything is seamless as a reality of process of potentials in becoming. The sun is likened to the eye of providence, the eye of Ra, the visible Helios, Apollo, surrounded by the nine divine muses, the spheres of harmony attributed to the spheres of the planets and the hypostases, which create the music of the heavens, the solar system and beyond the stars, fetching and performing a most splendid symphony. If the solar system is a chamber orchestra, then what magnificent sounds must the cosmic spectacle generate? At some places, a fallen cacophony of catastrophes of a cosmic scale, elsewhere, a most solemn anthem, yet elsewhere, songs of joy, sorrow, woe, and glory, of life and death. In transcendence, as Hyperion, it is simultaneously God amongst gods and his monadic manifestation, a corridor of fire. It is a collective in which fire, Agathos Daimones, sustained the orchestra from which single masks manifest as gods and goddesses of the sun and spirit intelligences belonging to the sun, as the face of Helios, the visible stars that the astronomers so adore to observe and measure with their instruments and calculations, the physical objective reality of shadows of philosophical essences. Stars are compared to the eyes of transcendent world. Eyes, yes, but not as human eyes, but the support of the intelligibility of the force of intellect, and 
God as eyes, also in turbulent unison in the Chaldean third transcendent, the fields of hypersolar Yaru, which the correct focus and concentration may penetrate when contemplating its own daimon, apotropaic, self-derived in autophania, self-manifestation in the light of the sun, just like Hyperion contemplates Ion and Ion contemplates Apollo and Apollo contemplates the visible light Helios and Helios contemplates the physical star penetrating it with insights and these known in antiquity as infinitely distant spheres of powerful light similar to the sun as Macrobius wrote in his commentary on the dream of Scipio Emilianus the ancients knew and I testify for their veritability if my word is bearing any weight of trust to my readers. Indeed, in the coupling of the function of the biological eye and its beginnings through echogenetic metaphysical atavisms, that is, a certain blueprint of possible evolutionary paths, would suggest that living organisms were inherently embedded in the potential for existence through appropriate environmental conditions. My personal theory of the origin of life is that electromagnetic vortices on the sun led to the quantum entangled state of micro vortices beneath the oceans on earth. Perhaps the micro vortices were created by earth's geomagnetic field that created micro turbulences as anomalies around which inanimate, that is non-organic matter and molecules organized which were the beginning that later became the basic of organic proteins and bonds during the subsequent formation of DNA spirals. This theory is only a far-reaching speculation, it has nothing to do with science. In this way, a star could plant the phenomenon of life on Earth with the available building blocks, a bow plan with resources from which it could emerge. Life is also a subclass of the indivisible world and thus it is fully integrated as a subsystem, a prominent example of the separateness of the vast categories of a unified, continuous world. Life outside conditions that favor it is not possible, but without the potential for its growth in this and other solar systems and exoplanets, resembling perhaps Earth, it would not have emerged anywhere at all. So how to solve the puzzle of the genius of life, the laws governing the demiurgic, platonically speaking, phenomenal cosmos without resorting to childish creationist theories, assuming a, a priori daddy mover, which would first need to be defined while not being favorable to the theory that the universe is completely mindless, finely tuned occult machine. The great gargantuan voids are ontologic in themselves, and matter of deifying them is not merely a matter of perception, but objective forces and powers that the right perception helps to understand. How is Neoplatonic theology to monads contain interconnected networks of mutually understood sensory intellect leading to ingenious solutions at every level of the cosmic spectacle? The atheist's answer is evasive. The deist includes other planes of the metopoetic world and also the geometric synergetic hidden theology. The generative theory assumes that the world clothes itself in its successive manifestations, becoming increasingly aware of its transformations, rectifications, while simultaneously opening itself to itself in every possible manifestation. The anima mundi, hecatic world soul, thundering genius, similar to a seed that does not know it will be a mighty thriving tree, yet still, this cycle is sustained. This is not a personal form of existence, but it clothes and veils itself in personal forms of its existence. I will use an analogy here. Just as Gaia in the Orphic hymns is the ever polypulsating, writing, flowing, flying multiplicity of life, beautiful in its innocent, renewing young aspect, Cruel, dreadful, tearing, decaying, scavenging, transient in its other seasons. Similarly, the transcendent world is grandeur, simplicity, beauty, the courage of motion, triumph and eros, subtlety, ecstasy, but also the black gaze of forms, the black and destructive fire of the tonic worlds of cosmic emptiness, voids and acts. Rectification of potentials drive towards hyperworlds, like Hecate Artemis Drachaina and her 
hunting dogs, chasing hares, escaping into supralunar worlds at each lunar palace. The first mystery of Hecate Drakaina, harmony with intention of opposites against the void towards heavens. The keys, the flame, and the sacrificial offering to the unwilling serpents. Hecate is the gracious lady, the guardian of the gates. The seals of cosmic maritime roads of Poseidon's cube, alike to a cosmic Isis Pelagia. The former in Chaldean theology does not so much chase the fugitives with her infernal dogs as to give them a lesson by revealing a secret of how to cross into celestial worlds by the unnecessary things being torn to shreds by her demonic hellhounds, including the beholder, he is wise and receives the teachings. The skin stripped from the Nemean lion, the probationer of mysteries, served as Heraclean attire when he became an adept. This is a metaphor in no way related to the actual Heraclean mysteries founded by the initiator, initiated of the Eleusinian mysteries, Heracles himself. The mysteries were accessible only to elderly people, not the Eleusis mysteries, the mysteries of Heracles. The Herculean club stands for completed zodiacal worlds and works at the end of one's life, throughout life. For each planet stationed in one of the twelve places of all domicile and excellence, the works are contained in the ritual of life and to each his own ordeals. Standing at any point in relation to the world, we are the center of everything. This is only an instrumental concept, of course, but every point is the center in relation to microcosm. From this point, we designate the cardinal directions whose total expression is the sphere. In the graduated view, we can designate a minima of 129,600 directions in the azimuthal sphere, although in reality we can designate an infinite number of them depending on the density of the angular measurements. This sphere divides itself into the cross of directions, or the rows of directions. It is the basic hermetic unit. Space itself and its description is already imbued with a certain mysterious formula, the depth, or as the Sumerians called Ashurako, the depth of the skies. The temple of the world is divided into the depths of each direction, but the formula of this direction is limited by the distribution of actual phenomena, their syntax and their formula. Beyond the world of phenomena, space collapses into non-existence and only omnipresence remains, which has parallel access to the entirety of the phenomenal world. Both Giordano Bruno 1548-1600 and Nicolas Cousanus 1401-1464 noted that the universe is infinite. The former in the Immenso mentioned the eternal motion of all worlds in relation to each other and others in the infinite universe. The latter considered the possibility of extraterrestrial cultures and civilizations. Space is opened by time, as time precedes space. Phenomenal time is the time in which flashes of energy in various forms manifest in the universe. Like space, time is omnipresent ceasing to exist in the a-phenomenal world. From the a-phenomenal point of view, the universal time has parallel access to the entirety of the phenomenal time. Thus arises the question, is everything determined and complete? It may be so in an absolute sense, yet the diversity of phenomena in the phenomenal world is the world of potential in the absolute world. Can the world of potential in any sense influence the absolute world? Or are phenomena somehow detached from the monument of transpatio-temporal topos? This is the fundamental question about the influence of the inner world on the outer world, the esoteric and the exoteric. Every direction has its mystical translation, which is a connection of the cycle of time with space, and metaphorically conveys meaning from the referent it points to, towards the observer. In the first instance of spatial description that has a reference to itself, to observe changes occurring in time, one must know the causality, knowledge of history, knowledge of humanity, and certain magisterial insight into the coupling of time with events, space with time, the genius of time with its eponym, 
Orphic Chronos, the genius of space with its archetypology. Next, the archaeology of this symbol and its traces allow one to transcend causality, even if for a while to view current events through a meta-historical, meta-political, meta-real perspective. Departing yet from grand history, the grand narration is tantamount to imprisoning the present and not being the prisoner of the present. Furthermore, the concept of metaphor of transferring meanings in the procession also concerns the transcendent view of events in time, as well as the knowledge of invisible rotations of spheres, cosmic zeitgeist, the ghosts of time that saturate their actions with essence and idea in the phenomenal world. Moreover, Metareal intuition allows reconstructing the movements of forces if one has a sufficiently brilliant intellect to penetrate transcendent worlds from which empirically one can conclude at most that they objectively exist as true forces, powers, that is, they are accessible to experience of mortals. The hypothetical inductive deductive metaphysical construction for some is merely a map written on the sea or some weird doubling in a puddle of water, seeing a gargantuan ocean instead of a plane. For others, an essential issue of understanding the world to make a mind as large as possible to survey the world from this perspective, how much more joy when it begins to war. And here we are, reading the songs of the world in every aspect, seeing the depth in every aspect. Some, like the waves of the sea, crash against the rocks. Others navigate its surface, yet others practice the Poseidonic art, seeing its depth, like Hermann Ubes, penetrating its veils, bringing nude, like Hecatic messengers. They open the seals and reveal strange, divine maritime routes to others. Let us then leave the diurnal matters to some, as archaeologists of nocturnal spheres, the mouth of the chaos onion currents, which may be sometimes delight to occultists, there are hidden things. However, let's crystallize our discoveries into a real alchemical crescendo into the realities of some notion of mastery. All reference points in a frame of reference where change plays a role, and everything is changing, and time functions as a clock. Time is in essence the registration of events, relative to events, within a certain frame of reference. Events are flashes of energy, like the Buddhists of secret teachings called Dr. Kosethi. They can be recorded as with the speeds of stars traveling through the galaxy, or synthetically referenced like waking up at 7 in the morning, using the conventional division of time into 24 hours, which is not a real physical clock, but merely a conventional circumstance. A galactic clock is the time it takes for a galaxy to complete a full rotation around its axis. A solar clock is the time it takes for a star to complete a full orbit around the galaxy's axis, but also relative to its planet and other stars. Planetary clocks function similarly in various frames of reference, relative to other objects, reference points, but also phenomena such as the speed of rotation around their own axis, changes in the intensity of the stellar magnetosphere. Natural clocks concern the biosphere, circadian clocks and atmospheric phenomena related to climate, as well as tectonic and geological changes of the climate itself. Metaphysical clocks say, pertain to invisible worlds and also to successive ionic incursions from astralistic sources or the clocks of the social logos, which mark the conventional beginning and the end of human epochs, the rise and collapse of civilizations, the catastrophes of ages of construing and flourishing. This does not mean perfect determinism or some form of organization that is completely absolute, but rather diverse oscillations, chaotic oscillations at times, around the seeds of a given zeitgeist or the nature of a given clocks, spirit. An example can be that galactic year I mentioned before, the full journey of the solar system around the galaxy's axis lasts around 225 to 250 million years. In about 4.5 billion years our galaxy will most likely collide with the Andromeda galaxy. Indeed, one could try to calculate eons relative to this event. That would be about 
6,800 Milky Way eons until the upgrade cataclysm could happen. Thus, we define an eon in this case by the completed cycle of movement, because space-time is associated with eternal movement. Eons are calculated by the completeness of movement, power or differentiation relative to the previous and subsequent closure of their actions. Similarly, considering the hypothetical time of our solar system's formation relative to Milky Way's rotations, 1800 solar system eons have passed concerning the galactic rotation. The Sun may turn into a supernova in additional 1800 years. This constitutes a million or greater eon, yet only from the perspective of the existence of the solar system. Frame of reference is the relative, codependent, covariant, but necessary to measure and derive wisdom and understanding as long as we can penetrate the content and the context of the causality of the clashes of events. Returning to Earth, the Earth's actual tilt oscillates between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees, changing approximately every 40,000 years. Moreover, the Earth's orbit around the Sun changes every 90,000 to 100,000 years, becoming more elliptical or closer to a circle. The approximately 6,250 Earth processions during a few rotation of the solar system around the galactic axis. The Earth's axis in the zenith pointed to the star Tuban in 2787 before modern era, which will point to Alderamin around 7500 common era. As the precession changes, so does the ecliptic, that is, equatorial belt of stars, including Paratelontas, or stars and constellations above and below the ecliptic. These also move relative to each other and the solar system. Let us remember. All are within the galactic gravitational field, though they do not affect each other differently than through the hypothetical grid within the galactic field, just as planets in the solar system do not interact gravitationally as individual objects, but through the force of the sun's stellar magnetosphere. The basic unit of change in the solar system is the solar repolarization cycle which occurs circa every 11-12 years, constituting a solar cycle. During a full precession of the Earth's axial tilt, there are approximately 3,333 such repolarizations. Only clocks are specific transitional points of time to time, marking a new charge of energies coupled with transcendental attributes in the hypostasis of worlds where changes occur. A neon in this case is a cut segment of a sequence of events different from the preceding one but closing a unity and the community of certain events at this specific time and relative to other co-eons, counter-eons, depending on the sum of all influences concerning the subject of their action and the idea merging with the subject of the theology, well, power, force. Time sequences are patterns, patterns of events as flashes of energy in the universe's field, organized by common features or categories. The closer to the monad in this model, the more infinite time is, becoming much too stable to exist at all. The more diverse, the more bifurcations. However, the function of time can be a constant wave with the distribution of events on various amplitude scales and oscillation functions where changes are sequential, clustered, constantly repeating, periodic, variable, but repeating, continuous, eternal, interrupted, causality as a result at some point in the course of the event in time, the pattern changes, energy is released and is invested elsewhere, or oroboric, eternal, sequential, continuous, circular. Additional time sequences can be referenced concerning a given subject, event or other time sequences, creating clocks in a frame of reference relative to other clocks, forming time nodes that will be significant when discussing anomalies and synchronicities. I also call them time hubs. Knowledge of co-arising, codependent causalities in time is the philosophical scaffolding. Knowledge of phenomena, their laws and content is the nourishing water to the vessel that is the wisdom and penetrative insight derived from the contemplative 
life and an active life in the world and a practiced experience. Acquit thus with the above, all things fall into accord out of their own consent in a harmonious way. And the changes are predicted, derived and understood with some notion of stability and tranquility. Only large and all-encompassing minds may master this, and only at certain propitious times. Not many may sustain it when they fall into disguard and pettiness. They are like quarreling ever distracted swathe of masses strangled by changes that can't discern even the tip of their nose and the grand mountains ahead of them and above them. Does it mean that everything will be fine and let go? No, because the point is that a certain order is preserved only for inasmuch as it is not destroyed or given to chaos, so it needs to be walked and told upon, because it won't be okay if you know. If the world will go to a nuclear destruction, that will be the end of the life on this planet and the end of human life. Would it increase some potentials? It wouldn't be the end of the universe or the solar system, it would be the end of the small species. So, walk, comment, and talk. Thank you.